Father, we just thank you for this evening. Just uh, ask now, Lord, as we take this time to fellowship with you and your spirit and with one another, Lord, that you would just help move us through this psalm, not missing what you have for us. I just pray, Lord, you'd shine a light upon it and guide us through it. And Lord, uh, again, we just thank you, Lord, for this just special time in the middle of the week to be with our brothers and sisters, to listen to you, and just to be thankful, Lord, for what we have around us and a place to meet. And so we yield to your Spirit's work here tonight, and we thank you in advance, and we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 6, I'm just going to read straight through it, and then we'll start to dig in. First, you'll notice the instruction, as many of these psalms have, probably bolded at the beginning of your <clears throat> psalm there. It says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. And we talked earlier that we don't know really how to understand that the input of that at the beginning of some of these psalms. Was it added later? Was it put there by the scribes? Some believe that it's actually part of the psalm, and, it's, and it is supposed to be within the actual text of the psalm. But we find it's written to the chief musician. We don't know who that is. There are singers and musicians mentioned in the Old Testament. Could be one of them. Chief musician, being it's capitalized, could be God himself. And it's very specific. It's with a stringed instrument, not only just a stringed instrument, but specifically an eight-stringed harp. So pretty specific. And then we're reminded that David is the author of this particular psalm. And let's remember before we get into what this psalm says and what David wrote there, most of you know David, King David. But remind, let's remind ourselves for a moment, you know, this was just a shepherd boy. A shepherd boy who was the young, youngest of many brothers, the son of Jesse. And you'll recall at that time, the nation of Israel got very hungry for leadership that looked like the nations around them. And so they cried out to, this, to the prophet Samuel, and they said, give us a king so we can be like the rest. And of course, they were being set apart such that God would have been their king, and they would have had a he heavenly leadership. But Samuel took them to task for that, but you may remember that God intervened and told Samuel, no, give them what they want. And as I like to point out often, if we go back and we read the warning then that Samuel gave to those people about what it would mean to have a king, we can come all the way to the days we're in now, and it hasn't changed. Whoever is in the headship of a country tends to have all those attributes that he warned them about. But then, so they raised up a man named Saul, and we know that Saul was a very complicated character. And, at the, and, and then at the same time, we remember that God had a man that would be king someday. He let the people do what they wanted to do, to get what they deserved in a sense. But the whole time, David was being groomed by God to be that king. But Saul saw that, and he began to persecute David badly, even though David was in service to him. And we saw how rich the spirit of David was when he was a child. The fact that he could go out there on the battlefield when they were there in the valley fighting the Philistines, who were giants, or at least had giants amongst them, real giants. And the Israeli army had cowered on the other side of the valley. And David came out to visit his brothers and bring back news to his father of what was happening on the front line. And in that moment, David was disgusted with the men of Israel. And he took it upon himself to go out onto that battlefield with a sling, to grab up five stones. It tells us five stones he gathered. And it doesn't tell us any more about that. But we find out through other studies that Goliath had four brothers that were also giants. So David was not only willing to go against the giant that the entire nation of Israel's armies would not, he was willing to stay in that battle against him and all his brothers. And you know the story. He slain him, and he gave God all the credit for that. But as good of a kid as, good of a, as kid, he was a good kid. But he grew up and became a man, and he made some really bad decisions. He let lust get to him, took another man's wife. Then he had that man killed to cover it up. And then he just, one by one, destroyed his family. 
And so David was a mess, and he made a mess. And he wrote some of these psalms, many of these psalms, as he was running from the persecution, being pursued by Saul, being pursued by his own demons, if you will, from the things that he had done, pursued at one point by his son, actually, who had usurped his throne, and all the memories of everything he did. So David was an amazing man, an amazing king, an amazing child, amazing man of God. As a matter of fact, we know that God calls David a man after his own heart. And those are the kind of things that we marvel at, but should also give us great hope because, yes, we can mess up our lives, and yet God has a place in a, for us and a way for us to be redeemed. And all those sins are the sins that Jesus went to the cross to die for. And so it gives us hope. I mean, we don't want to be like David just because we can or because it certainly isn't what we should do. But it's good to see that God's mercy is so great. And so here we come into this psalm with David really feeling all of what I just talked about, probably the good and the bad, but right now the bad had risen to the top and he was being drowned by it. So let's pick up there the rest of verse 1 and then to the end of the psalm. It says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me from your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Now, one of the things we need to know about Psalm 6, remember, there's 150 psalms. And at the very beginning, when I, get an, when I did the introduction to psalms, I said there was all these different ways we can divide the psalms up into different categories, different themes. Well, Psalm 6 is known as the first of what are called the seven penitential psalms. Now, they're not in order, but there are seven that have this particular flavor, this, this theme to them. And in those penitential psalms, the writers are confessing their sin, and they're being disciplined by God, and their experience in suffering. Now, the other psalms, just for you note-takers, if you want to know, the other psalms that are in this category are Psalms 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. Waiting for someone to scream bingo. Um, now, these kind of psalms are helpful. And the truth is, all the psalms are helpful. The psalms really serve as a guide for really all the emotions that we go through in this life. There really isn't an emotion you could describe that the psalmists haven't spoken of, and very honestly. And that's what I love about the psalms, because you can go there and you can see the evidence that God wants us to be honest with him. He wants us to tell him how we feel. Even with reverence, tell him how we feel about him. And the reason we can do that and the reason we should not hide from that is because you're not telling him anything he does not already know. As a matter of fact, that is the definition of confession. The definition of confession is to agree with God. I mean, if you have something to confess to God, he's not, he's not like surprised by it. He doesn't come back and say, no way. No, you're agreeing with what he already knows. But by doing that, we clear the air for ourselves. And there's so much benefit to getting it out. So these psalms are very helpful when we need to confess our sins, when we need to draw closer to the Lord. And in this psalm, David describes the stages of this trying experience that he's in. And by faith, he moves through those stages, and it takes him from trials to triumph. Now, one of the things I want to make note of in this psalm is eight times in the psalm, David addresses God as Lord, Lord with all caps, L-O-R-D, all capital letters. And what we find there when we go into the Hebrew, 
is that's the covenant name of God. And the way we usually speak that name is Jehovah or Yehovah, depending upon um, however you've been taught to say it. And the Bible reveals Jehovah as God's unique name. And it comes from a Hebrew verb that means to become. But I think there's many scholars that would agree the better definition is he causes to become. And that's a fitting name for God. It's a fitting name for this Jehovah in his role as creator and the fulfiller of his own purposes. He causes to become. Now, the name Jehovah or Jehovah is actually an English translation of the Hebrew name for God that we find in Scripture. And in that name that's, that's defined as or written as Lord, all caps, it's just four Hebrew letters. Just four Hebrew letters. yad Hey vav Hey. Now, the Hebrew language, very interesting. 22 letters, interchangeable, also their number system, 1 through 22. And it's all consonants. It's all consonants. And they get their vowel sounds by just three different Hebrew letters in front of another letter. And that's how they get it. In modern times, what they did was to try to make it easier for people to learn the language and to speak the language and teach kids the language. They came up with a vowel system. There's little symbols that they put either above and mostly below the letters to give you the vowel sounds. And it's interesting because when I visited Israel, I was looking everywhere at the Hebrew writing and having you know, studied Hebrew as a child, there was none of those vowel sounds, those little vowel markings. And, and I kind of embarrassed myself because I asked our tour guide, Ami, I was like, when I was learning Hebrew, we had these, and I explained it to him, and, and he's looking at me kind of strange, and, and then he says, yeah, because that's what we use to teach our kids the language. I was like, oh. Um, so when you get to a certain point, you understand the language just like we do, just like we do about our own language, and you don't need all those rules, all those rules they wasted all those years teaching us. All those years they taught us the language we already spoke. What a waste of time. What a waste of time. So that name of God, Jehovah, that comes from those four letters is known as the Tetragrammaton. Big word that simply means four letters. Now, some point in history, there was a decision made that the name of God could not be spoken. It was too holy. You couldn't speak the name of God. You'll see sometimes in a writing that they won't even, if they even put the word God in the text, they won't write G-O-D. They'll write G and like put a slash and a D, trying not to actually say it. And it's an act of reverence. No, but nothing in the Bible instructed them to do that. That's just what they decided to do. And because of the way that this was put together, and, and there was a lot of mystery no one really knows how those four letters are actually spoken. So when they tried to figure out how to make a word out of yad he vav he, those four letters, they did something strange. Matter of fact, when they decided that they couldn't speak those four letters, they used a diff- started using a different word in the Hebrew, and that was Adonai. Adonai means Lord L, lowercase o-r-d, which means my Lord. And then they did this weird thing. They took the vowel symbols from that Hebrew word, Adonai, and they moved them up over underneath the yad heh vav heh And the rules of Hebrew say you can't even, it makes no sense. It does, but that's what they did, and that's how we got Jehovah. And so I, I just wanted to tell you, I mean, it's, it's kind of it's nutty, but there's a lot of man involved in this, you know, as far as the names. In the Hebrew, we don't have to worry about it. It's as pure as can be. But what's happened in the translations into the English has been very, uh, very interesting and complex. And if I lost you, you're probably still fine. Um, so let's, li- let's dig into the verses. Verse 1. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. So we don't know the exact occasion of this song. Um, some of the Psalms, we know exactly when David wrote them. And we could guess, but we probably don't, shouldn't. Um, but we can see here, because of his sin, David sensed he was under the rebuke of God. 
And therefore, he called out to God to lighten his chastisement. Now, there's many times in our lives as believers when we're chastened, chastised by God. But sometimes we're suffering just because of stuff we brought on ourselves. And we just need to understand that. We need to have a discernment that we're, where we can look and say, okay, God's working something out in me. Or, you know what, I'm in all this pain and tribulation because of a decision I made, of an action I took. And, and we just got to be careful we're not blaming our own stuff on God and thinking he's working something out when we've made a mess of things. But there are certainly times when the Lord does chasten his children. And we can hear here in the language that David writes that he's feeling sick. You know, we could, we, it would not be wrong to say that David was ill at this point. And some illnesses can be due to things like unconfessed sin in the life of a believer. Matter of fact, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we'll be soon on Sundays. And it speaks there, it says, it says this, it says, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. What was happening in that situation? Well, the people in the church at Corinth were failing to examine themselves, and they were approaching the communion in an unworthy manner. And so they were harboring sin, and the, the Scripture says that some of them were sick because of that action. Of course, that's not always the case. God will sometimes permit illness or tribulations as a catalyst for the display of his own power and his glory. He's working something out, and he's going to let that thing, whatever it is, be in a person's life so that he gets the glory when that's worked out. We read about that in a couple places. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so right away, the disciples assume, well, he's blind. He's got to be in sin. Why else would he be blind? Or if it's not his sin, then it must be his parents because they believed in generational sin, curses being sent down through the generations. But Jesus said it was neither that, that God was going to glorify himself in the healing of this man. And those of us that have witnessed healings, we've, we know that that to be true. God is glorified in that. We also, in chapter 11 of John, verse 3 and 4, it says, therefore, the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick, speaking of Lazarus. And when Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And that's an interesting thing that Jesus said there, because to, our, to the human experience, Lazarus was dead. Jesus calls him out of the tomb, back to life, after he'd been in there for days but it was to glorify God. You know, God sometimes allows tough times as a means of producing spiritual fruit. So things will come from our lives that will not only edify us, edify others, but, but bring glory to God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, we read, we also glory in tribulations. Now, not a lot of people can say that, but that's what we're asked to do, to glory in our tribulations knowing, it says, that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. You know, we're wired to go any way we can around a problem. You know, we'll go around it, we'll go over it, we'll go under it, we'll turn around and go the other way. Or we'll immediately try to pray it away. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you know, going immediately to prayer. Matter of fact, what a great habit to have. Although sometimes we need to understand that God may have you there for a season because he's working something out in you. And I happen to be one who believes in God's perfect will and his permissive will. And you don't have to agree with me on that. But I believe God has a perfect will. He knows exactly how he wants things to work out. But I think sometimes we can pound our hands and cry a lot and God will let us move in the direction that we want having not learned the lesson that he wanted us to learn. And it's funny how those things kind of come back around because he still wants us to learn it. Sometimes God will allow things in our lives to prevent sin. I remember, or we remember in Paul's case, and we read about it in 2 Corinthians, 
that he brought something into Paul's life to prevent him from having the sin of pride. And we read there in chapter 12 of that book, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And so that trouble there God gave so that Paul would not have to fight with that problem of pride. Now in this psalm, David asked that God not chasten him with hot displeasure. Wow, it's a real poetic way of saying wrath. Kind of interesting that he used those words. And we know that God's chastening hand is not primarily a mark of his displeasure. It's just the way David was thinking. And that's very typical of us as well. In our flesh, we're going through something. We're going through a season of tribulations, troubles, sickness maybe. And immediately, the enemy whispers in our ear and says, well, you must have done something wrong. I mean, you must have sinned. You must have failed to please God. And that's not necessarily the answer, unless you know there's something there, and that's true, and then you confess it and repent. But so much, so many of the times, we just get that guilt trip going instead of just locking in and praying about, well, okay, so God, what are you doing? Well, let me discern what you're doing. What is this chastening that you're doing in my life? And the fact is, is that chastening is, is a mark of adoption. And what do I mean by that? Well, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the writer there, chapter 12, verse 7, makes it clear that chastening is evidence of our adoption. And remember, we're adopted into the family of God when we come to be saved. And that's such a special thing because in the culture of that day, an adopted son almost had more rights than the natural son because he was so special. He was so special. And so we are so special to God when we're saved. And because we're special to him, he chastens us. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't a loving father chasten their son and daughter to make sure they're raised right, to stay out of trouble, to stay on the path that they'll bring them the kind of life they should have? That verse says there in Hebrews, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And that's such an important thing because We've kind of come up through, well, let's say a decade and a half of, uh, of a lack of chastening by parents. You know, there's, uh, <laughs> I just think of too many examples I've watched. One, two, okay, I'm going to start over. One, two, you know, when there just needs to be something applied to the backside, you know, to straighten out. Unfortunately, God doesn't reach down and spank us, but there are times it feels like it. And then we have to realize, you know, that's for my own good. You know, but we've watched even, like I said, that slip in, in human parenting. But God's not a human parent. God is God, and he loves us, and he wants the best for us. And the truth is, when God corrects us, it doesn't feel pleasant necessarily. But it's good, and it's for our good. And remember this, David lived before the finished work of Jesus. He lived before the cross. And that means David had less certainty about his standing with God. Now on this side of the cross, we know that all the anger that God has toward the believer was poured out on Jesus on the cross. He bore that so that we wouldn't have to. Doesn't mean that we deserve it less. As a matter of fact, we know we do deserve it. And yet he took it upon himself God's chastening of the believer is out of a correcting love, not out of anger. Look at verse 2. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? So David had this feeling that he was wasting away. His bones pained him. Even his inner life, his emotions, his intellect, his will were being affected. And it seemed that David, <clears throat> to David that the Lord was slow in responding. And anybody that's walked with the Lord for a while goes through that. You've prayed for something and you wonder if God will ever answer. Or you observe something and you know it's something that God doesn't like. He has displeasure with that. But why is he not stopping it? And of course, we look around the world and we see 
the fruit of the wicked, and we wonder, you know, how long, just like the psalmist, and yet we're guaranteed in the word of God by promise that it will all be dealt with someday. But he's wondering how long because of the pressure that he's under. So he asks how long it would be before he would graciously heal him. And these trials of body and soul were amplified by David's sense of God's anger against him. Again, he's, the enemy is in his head. The enemy's whispering that it's you. He's mad at you. He doesn't like you. And boy, the enemy's good at telling us those things. And when we're not confident in God's love and assistance, even small trials feel unbearable. And that's what David was going through in his weakness. Look at verse 4. Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? So David felt that God had turned his back on him. Perhaps even deserted him. So he asked God to return and then begins to reason with him. Now, of course, God does not leave us, nor does he forsake us, the scripture tells us. If we feel distant from God, it's because we're distant from God, because he's immovable. He's always there. It's us that drifts. But we know in those times of trouble, it's really easy to feel like, well, maybe he's just not there. Maybe he's not listening. Maybe I've gone so far this time, he's done with me. Those are all those things that our flesh tells us, that the enemy whispers to us. Now, the fact is, every Jew knew that the Lord was merciful and gracious. We read that in Exodus chapter 34. Moses was up on the mountain, went up to meet with God on the mountain there. And it says, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. There's no doubt every Jewish person had heard that story, read those words. So deep in David's heart, it's locked in. He knows, but he's struggling to find that truth because everything else is overwhelming. So with this understanding, David asked God to manifest that mercy to him and spare his life. And then in verse 5, David asks, In the grave, who will give you thanks? I like this part, where, how where Dave, uh, David is thinking. Now, the word grave in the Hebrew is sheol. It's a word that can mean the grave, or it can also mean the realm of the dead. And here it means the latter, the realm of the dead. And in Old Testament times, people didn't have a clear revelation of the afterlife that was brought by Jesus. And I say in Old Testament times, but really anybody outside the family of God still doesn't really understand the afterlife. They have thoughts or they have lies. And one thing they definitely have is a lack of hope. And you see sometimes in the the times of death in some of those cultures, the insanity It'll fill a person's mind how they act because they have no idea what's next for that person. And we, you know, are so blessed to to know because we believe and we know what the word tells us because it's been revealed to us. Matter of fact, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, it says, but it says, has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. But David's reasoning here is a body in the grave can't praise or serve God. And David wasn't certain what his spirit could do for God if he was in Sheol. So his conclusion, it would be, (laughs) he's giving God advice here. It would be wiser for the Lord to deliver him and let him live because he still had work to do. So God, I'm not ready for that yet. I have things to do. I mean, how, what can I be for you if I'm there? And so he's using this to reason with God, to bring in that case before him. Look at verse six. David says, I am weary with groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. And here we get some idea of the depth of David's misery by this description of his condition. I mean, he was completely worn out 
with moaning and groaning. All night, he says, he soaked his pillow with crying, drenched his couch with his tears. And it even sounds like his eyes had become sunken to, to the grief that he was in. And we've seen, probably most of us, what that level of stress can do to a person's appearance. And he says his vision was fading because of the oppression of all of his enemies. He believed that life was filled to overflowing with trouble when he couldn't stand anymore. Now, there's at least three components to this trial that David is under. David felt God was angry with him. David lacked a sense of God's presence. And David couldn't sleep. So God's chastening hand was heavy upon him. And his life seemed to be nothing but tears and misery. And David was brought so low that the presence of his enemies no longer prompted him to seize the victory. He was just done. He was really at his end at this point. But look what happens. Verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. So with these closing verses, there's a sudden change from suffering to joy. And we see that so much in David's Psalms. He lays out his heart. He speaks the truth about what he sees, what he feels, what he thinks about God and being too slow or not doing what he believes he should be doing. We just see him lay it all out there, his pain. And then in the end, not so much here, but he comes back to a heart of worship. Here he comes back to, the, to just a revelation that God is there. He has heard me. And I believe, and this is my belief, that that is the key reason that God calls David a man after his own heart. That he could look at a man like David with all his sin and all of his discretion, bad choices, consequences. But a man after his own heart, I believe, if any of us want that title, is the fact that we would always return to him no matter what. That our heart was always towards him. No matter how far we drifted, no matter how much trouble, no matter how much sin, that, are, that we would recognize it, we would confess it, we would repent it, and we would return. Because our heart is after him. And I believe that's why he was able to call David that. And his Psalms reflect that. Now, it does, it's not important whether this change that we see here occurred later or immediately after David prayed. But he felt healing in his body, it seems. And he felt peace in his heart and his mind. And David used this experience to glorify the Lord for what had occurred. And our conclusion from David's experience is if we turn to God, even if it's back to God and pray and trust him, that we will find his grace sufficient for our needs. But if we keep moving in the direction of our pain, never looking back, never looking to him, never praying, just being mad or sick or what have you, then we don't get that because we have a place in this formula. We have something we must do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. What a beautiful thing. I mean, we really don't have words to describe the strength of God. We could try. We could come up with all flowery ways, write stories about his strength, but we, don't, we can't even come close to understanding his strength. And then we're told that that strength is made perfect in our weakness. That's grace. He fills in where we can't do it. He fills in where we're weak. And that's the way that he works in us. And again, it's that love of a father. Now, truth is, the Lord may not do what we ask when we want it but he will do what he needs to be done, ultimately to help glorify himself. So I would say the question we should ask is not when will I get out of this, but what can I get out of this? I think that's the way to approach those times of trouble. We may pray to get out of it, but while we're in it, we need to see what God's doing. So we will rest there for tonight. Any questions, comments?